Rabbi Laser Brody was born in Washington, D.C. in 1949 after receiving his bachelor's degree in agriculture from the University of Maryland in 1970. He moved to Israel and joined the Israel Defense Forces Regular Army and served in one of the elite special forces units. He's a decorated combat veteran of two wars and dozens of counter insurgencies and anti-terrorist missions on both sides of Israel's border. After surviving a near suicidal mission to Beirut during the Israel-Lebanon conflict in 1982, Brody could no longer ignore the hand of God in his life. He became a Baal Shuva and left his mountaintop farm to study Torah in Jerusalem. Nine years of intensive Talmudic, ethic, and legal studies led to his rabbinical orientation or ordination in 1992. He devoted another two years of postgraduate study to personal and family counseling and subsequently spent two years as rabbi and spiritual rehabilitation director of a major Israeli prison. There, he created a highly successful program of, of spiritual rehabilitation for prisoners based on tshuva. In 1996, Brody moved to Ashdod and became the, the understudies of the famed Melitzer Rebbe, a contemporary giant in rabbinical law and personal counseling. Two years later, Rav Shalom Arush opened a branch of his renowned Chutz Shel Chesed Breslev Yeshiva in the port of city of Ashdod and appointed Brody as the Rosh Kolel or Dean of the rabbinical program. In addition, Brody holds a personal fitness trainer and health coach certification from Action and Expert Rating. That blew me away, just so you know. <laughs> he holds a specific specialized certification in senior uh, fitness, holistic nutrition, and Pilates as well. As a rabbi, he realized that most health problems stem from spiritual and emotional difficulties, as well as lack of awareness of basic fitness and preventative measures. Today, Laser Brody dedicates his time to Jewish outreach and to help people attain their very best in physical and spiritual health while looking at the whole person, body, and soul. The many books that Rabbi Brody has written attends, attest to his unique emphasis on simple faith, known in Hebrew as emuna, as the key to spiritual and emotional health and wellness which is inseparable partners with the physical fitness and nutrition. Welcome. <laughs> we just, we prepared this interview at the last minute. We were so honored that you decided to so come. So honored. Show. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi Brody, for being here today. It's such an honor to have you on Yentas in the City. Um, Rabbi, your mission statement is, quote, Emuna is synonymous to optimism when a person realizes that the Almighty can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. There is no room for despair in life. Knowing this is a basic human right that all mankind is deserving of, end of quote. Uh, Rabbi Brody, can you please explain to our viewers what is Amuna and Bitachan, and what do you think step one should be for someone who is starting on this journey? What should be their mindset? Is it easier to start this journey when you are struggling, or can someone learn about Amuna even when everything in their life is good? And should it be confronted and talked about, or do, or do you believe one either has Amuna or doesn't? Uh, a lot of questions in one question. But... <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's break them down. Okay, first of all, Mrs. Koy, Mrs. Mizrahi, thank you so much for, for having me, for hosting me. It's an honor to be with you and anyone. I partner with anyone that helps other people feel better about themselves, especially to feel better about the Yadut, the, the Judaism. But it's not just about Judaism, Emunah is for the whole world. Because we're about this very soon, uh, the Chag Matan Torah, we we'll receive the Torah anew. And the very first mitzvah of the Torah is the mitzvah of Emunah. When Hashem revealed himself on Mount Sinai and he said, I am the Lord your God. Hashem, Hashem revealed himself and then we, we, on Mount Sinai so that this is ingrained in our souls. So this will keep us going to the difficulties all, all over. Now, to, the, the question, that uh, Mrs. Cohen asked me if uh, it's there or not. That's like saying a professional football player 
The guy's 320 pounds and he's covered with muscle from head to toe, and he can run the 40 yards. And if it's you the physical fit, or no, no, he worked long to build that. Just as you have to work long and hard to build a physical body, you have to work long and hard to build emona. This is the strength of the soul. And you don't build the strength of the soul by eating chocolate ice cream. I'm sorry. There's a lot of people think that uh, life should be comfort zone and everything wonderful. But if we look at King David was Mashiach. Mashiach means the anointed king. Nobody except Avram Avinu and Yaakov Avinu, Abraham and Jacob, nobody had a more difficult life than King David. King David, he grew up, uh, his brothers hated him, his fathers thought he was an Ill 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 illegitimate child. Uh, before his bar mitzvah, he fought Goliath. Uh, his father-in-law was jealous of him. King Saul tried to kill him. His wife gave him a rough time. He had two sons that revolted to get in. Enemies within, enemies without. Anybody else would be on a psychiatrist's chair. Anybody else be King David. But what does King David do with his difficulties in life? He wrote Sefer Tehillim. He wrote the greatest bestseller in history, 150 Psalms that anytime we pick up Tehillim and we see this and we, we relate to it. Why do we relate to it? Because King David was Mashiach and he understood every neshama. His neshama was like a kaleidoscope of all our neshamot, of all our souls, his soul. So he feels us, we feel him. And everything he said, we relate to. And it's another thing, it's, it's no coincidence that King David's Yerulah, his yard site, is also six of Sivan on Shavuot. We renew Shavuot and then new, this, is, this is King David. So you have to build a Munah. You have to build a Munah. Now, for someone that doesn't have emona, take the same person. A person could be walking the street, have a person, a good physique and a good potential, but he's not an athlete, he's a good coach. And the same thing with the spirit. A person may be happy, but even if a person has like what, what Mrs. Cohen asked me, what if a person for someone has a good life, not just that. Uh, I, for one, came to emona from a really difficult situation, a really difficult situation, a life and death situation. I don't suggest that anybody wait for that. That's like waiting, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, for a terminal disease that before a person goes to see a medical care, see a doctor. Now don't wait for that. Have a checkup every once in a while, make sure you're healthy. Don't wait for a life and death situation to look for emona. It's good It have like the peacetime army. This is your protection. Not only okay. that, that's exactly, uh, we were going to ask you that. You're, you're not an ordinary rabbi. Let's just say, I read your, you know, we've been following you for a long time. I listened to your lecture. We got so excited when we, we found out that you're here. And you come actually from secular world, which surprised me. I never knew that. And at one point of your life, since you touched on it, I really want you to talk about it. You decided to, to become Baal Tshuva. Can you tell us about your childhood? Take us to that moment uh, that you decided to become a religious man and then become a rabbi and, and can you connect it to Emuna? Since to okay. answer Ken's question. First of all, it's interesting. I think my story is like a miniature story of the Jewish people. Uh, I was born in Washington, DC, four years after World War II was over. My father was a pilot in the RCAF and Canadian Air Force. My father was born in Winnipeg. His parents came to Canada from Ukraine, but uh, with Ukrainian Jews. My mother was born in Belarus in Grodno, and she got out the last boat before the Holocaust. And they wouldn't have got out on that. This is, the, you could see the, even the story of our family because she came home from school, the Polish girls in school, they decided to play pincushion. And my mother was the pincushion, and she came home covered in blood from head to toe. The pins, and and my, my grandfather said, we got to leave right away. My grandmother didn't want to leave because her father was uh, uh, stolen a chassid. He was a red bin, And he said, oh, he hears that America is not a kosher place. But says, OK, you can stay here with your father, said my grandmother. But I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to leave my, my daughter to be like this. So they, they right away left. And they made the last boat out. There was a Hagrala, there was a lottery. Who's going to get on the boat? The 2,000 families wanted to get on the boat, and there were 500 places. 
And my mother and her parents were number 497 out of 500. Okay. So they came, they made it to America at the very end of 1938. The same boat that brought them to America was sunk by the Nazis on the way back to Poland. The Podolia, SS Podolia. Wow. Okay. My father, he had a rough time in World War II because he was the only Jewish pilot in Western Canada. And not only did he have the Nazis as an enemy, he had the anti-Semitic Canadians as an enemy. In other words, there the guys in his own unit couldn't stand it because he was Jew. And the Jew is not supposed to be a pilot. So I grew up in a home with a very big Zionistic outlook. And uh, Judaism traditional, uh, we had Friday night dinner and then afterward watch a movie on the TV. Like the Israeli, had, the Israeli yeah. type. <laughs> yeah, you know, like American, American conservative, American conservative. I had a bar mitzvah in a conservative synagogue and, and this is it, okay. But it was strong Jewish identity, very strong Zionistic identity. And so I decided as growing up, I never felt American, I felt Jewish. And hearing my mother's stories and hearing my father's stories, and I said, no, for me, I, I don't want to happen to Jewish people what happened in World War II. So I did something completely out of the box. Every, almost everything in my whole life is out of the box. I went to University of Maryland, and I studied agriculture. But no Jewish boy studies agriculture. And I was in the fact of agriculture with a bunch of rednecks from uh, Alabama and Mississippi. <laughs> okay. So some people call me Rabbi Redneck. Rabbi <laughs> Redneck. That's funny. Yeah. Because he pictures on the, on the website, ride, ride horses and a farmer and this, that. So I decided I want to be a farmer and a fighter. And I did both. So the day I finished University of Maryland, I went, got on a plane, came to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, I went to Kibbutz Debel Care, where Ben Gurion was. And I was there. And then I went into the army and a very good infantry reconnaissance unit, very outstanding unit. And Bo Hashem, I was in good shape because I was in athletics. Everything I did was to prepare myself for Eretz Yisrael. Okay, everything. And uh, after eventually I left the kibbutz and I had a moshav up in Samaria on the old 1967 border. I was named Meami. I was from that, that moshav and I raised it. Then this, that, that took me up all the 1973, the Yom Kippur War, and I didn't wake up. I should have woken up back then. But I had this lifestyle, you know, playing a good time and the Zionism and, you know, Hashem, okay, no, Hashem is somewhere, maybe somewhere, but nah, don't tell me what to do. The Torah is not going to tell me what to do. Oh, yeah, Torah is not telling me what to do. So I had another couple of wake-up calls in on the way, uh, like the counter-terror missions and the, the Litani mission and a lot of service up north and inside Lebanon, inside etc. Until came 1982, the first Lebanon War. In 1982, the first Lebanon War, uh, I was in a situation where I'm not going to come home, not going to make it out of here. It was in downtown Beirut. And uh, when I was in a crossfire, and the life expectancy was very short. I said, there's no way to get out, logically, to get out where I was. And Right in the middle of that, I thought that I had lost my marbles. One thing, my forte, all the guys in the unit were bigger and stronger than me, but I had the strong will. I had strong will. I was like, a, a, a do keep on going all day long. And that's, that's why they liked me in the unit. But uh, I thought that was it. Either I lost my mind or else something is happening. Something's happening. I called out to a shim. I never called out to Hashem in my life. And my neshama, it's like not, a, not, a, not an audio voice, not something you could hear, but something I felt is that I'm with you. I'm going to get you out of here. And I thought it was either 50% I'm crazy or 50% there's Hashem in the world. <laughs> What's going on here? So I said, if I'm crazy, I'm crazy. And if it is Hashem, and if I do get out of here, because logically, and I know I've been 1982, I had been in the army for 11 years already. Wow. Uh, 11 years, and that's uh, pretty good. I was a really veteran combat sergeant. Uh, 
No, I didn't. And you knew what the odds are to get out of there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's not like I was coming to a place I didn't know. The odds were not good. And my bunnies, we had the, the squad, my squad uh, of 12, that four were in bad shape, four were in very bad shape. And uh, even, even that I got, my, my eye got cut open with a, a piece of a machine gun machine gun went through. I was hiding behind a car and a spray of machine gun bullets went through the car windows and a piece of ga glass cut open my eye. And I thought oh, I had right. lost the eye, I had the sensation. There's a lot of nerves in the eye. And uh, that was it, the pressure, that's it. My radio man, he was hurt really bad. And uh, I had to put a tourniquet on his thigh to stop the bleeding. There's a main vein in the thigh, just like in, in the neck and could lose blood very fast. And it, one thing after another, and the, it keep holding in on us. The first Katusha, it lands 400 meters, then 200 meters, and they know where they are, and then 100 meters. When a Katusha, a Katusha rocket land, lands 100 meters, you could feel everything inside. You could feel your stomach, your gallbladder, your fluid, everything vibrates inside, it's a jewel. And- uh, Did you feel Hashem's presence at that moment? Like that Hashem was there with you? You said that you could feel everything, so you felt definitely, like definitely. It like I felt, I felt like I had a, a protective cloud. So I'm get, gonna get you out of here. This is the feeling. I'm gonna get you out of here. And so I made a deal with that feeling I had. I said, if I'm not going crazy, it's fifty percent. I'm not going crazy, and it is Hashem, and you do get me out of here, and then feel you got to change your life. You got to change your life. And I said, deal, and keep my word. If I get out here alive, new life. New life, new priorities, new everything. And one thing happened, another whole series, a chain of events, miracles, miracles. And we did get out of there. Not only did we get out of there, we finished the mission, and I kept my part of the deal. I so at that, at that point, you were about, would you say, 22 years old, 23? No, no I, was, I was 32 years 30. old. Oh, 32. Wow. Were you, oh, 32 were you years married old. at the time? Did you have kids? Were you married? Yeah, yeah. I was married. I already had, uh, already had three kids. And uh, Now, when you got back home after, because a lot of stuff you cannot, I come from a military background. So all oh, my father, Air Force, my grandfather, everybody for many years, 27 years, 22 years, a lot of things you're not allowed to talk about. So you show up home, your wife is not religious at the time, right? Uh, here's the thing, this is what this was, uh, I had, I don't like to talk about it much, but I had a chuva divorce because my, my first wife was then, she came from a modern Orthodox home and she had no problem marrying a secular guy. I was a secular guy, had no problem at all. But when I wanted to become uh, observant, and when we do something, you do it right. You don't do something halfway. <laughs> there's Shohan and there's Torah. What, this, this, no. And then what, what, it really, what really split it is that uh, I said, look, there's, there's Torah Mishpacha. I told her, I tried to influence her, I tried to, but I, they, back then, there were no Balchuva rabbis. Today, for example, when I graduated uh, by Asia Torah in the rabbinical school by Noah Weinberg, Uli Zohar was, Uli Zohar was a year before me, okay? He was the first graduating class of Asia Torah. Everybody thought Rabbi Noah Weinberg, Zetzal, he's crazy. He's making a, a, a coil of hola for Balei Tshuva. And people used to, they used to make fun of us. So yesterday, these guys are, are eating cheeseburgers. And, and today, they're, they're a bonim. You're not supposed to say that to a Balei Tshuva. It's, a, the, the word, it's called onat varim. You're not supposed to remind somebody, oh, yesterday you were a chiloni, or yesterday you would break Shabbat. They, they're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to tell a, 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 a person who was in prison, Oh, yesterday you were a convict. You can't do that. You can't be trying to go to leave. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, but the people did that, right and left. And this way, 
this this one reason my one of my most popular Hebrew books is called Nafshiti Dom. It's based on prayer. Nafshiti Dom. It's all about verbal abuse. And I couldn't write a book about verbal abuse. Also, if I was just eating chocolate ice cream, so it's because I had to I, I had to build up myself and give me give myself a spiritual antidote against all this. But this is what happened. And Rambo, he didn't care. He didn't care. He did that. And so what happens at that time, I didn't have a rabbi that understood me. What did you tell you? You need a rabbi that understands you. And uh, back then, it didn't get the best advice, whatnot. Today, uh, we go, slow people down, get the couple together, make the right. couple. Gishu, you do. Yeah, yeah Gishu, I guess that, but then they told me, oh, you know, how can you not have Tarat Mishpacha? No, you, this is correct that you got to do. And I you know I was going to listen to the commander. And to me, the rabbi was a commander. So, okay, what happened? This was from Hashem. But my my wife, my Rabbanit Yehudi, she's very wonderful, by the way. By the way, I've got to know, uh, when I had my free choice, now we're in, I married to a Sephardi, huh? Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Laser Brody's wife is a Sephardi, huh? So your Shabbat, dinners are, your Shabbat dinners are yummy. Yummy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> different, very different. <laughs> very yummy. She was born in Yafu. Her parents came from Istanbul. And, oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Turkey. And, uh, yeah, My husband's uh, t- 10 generation in Israel. But he's a Turkey. <laughs> oh, is a Turkey. The one Turkey. Also. So, did did her, you, does her family, did they speak Ladino? Si. si. You are wow. Ladino. I learned oh. from my father-in-law. Wow, you speak oh. Ladino. I know a little Ladino. <laughs> yeah, Bo Hashem, but uh, I know the not nice stuff from a Ladino. My father-in-law wasn't religious. My wife, she's a Bala uh-huh. And my wife was a sergeant in the tanks in Yom Kippur War. Oh, wow. wow. So she wow. is a very special woman, and she's the greatest. And, and this is really this is this is my zibuk. I didn't go through all this thing. Yeah. And uh, so that was it's all the best. That, yeah. Thirty two years we're married. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Wow. And, wow. and I always say she's my motor. I'm not just saying this, but uh, a man is like a fuselage. He's like That's an fun. airplane body. Everybody sees the fuselage, but nobody sees the motor behind. I could not do. What I do if I didn't have such a rabbinate at home? Wow! Absolutely. Behind behind every great man, there's a great woman. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. <laughs> now, Rabbi, I know that we're limited with time because we know you have to speak tonight. So I, I want to ask you shift a little bit and ask you a question, if I can. Anything um, you like. So I'd like to know for people who are struggling. Um, to come close to Hashem and Judaism, how can we deal with these terrible situations where you have what people once thought was a respected rabbi or teacher, and they turn out to be some sort of a predator, unfortunately, like I am Walder? Oh, wow. That is a painful question, but, uh, and I tell you, very painful, but you it have is to understand, painful. you have to understand that the stakes are so high, and Muna is such a such a valuable commodity, much more than diamonds from mine in South Africa. And the evil inclination, the Yetzirah Hava, he will do anything to knock people down. Yes, why? You know, you know, it's funny. When I was a secular university student and a secular soldier, uh, we had a good time. We had a good, we made a good time. We would go out with girls and we'd party and we'd do all kinds of stuff. And okay, but it was like a healthy good time. I was an athletic. I didn't do anything like drugs or any other kind of stuff, but you know, healthy good time. I never heard of a pedophile as a, as a chiyuni. I never heard of this. And, and come inside and to hear, and I hear people, people come to me with problems. I'm not going to mention, I get a, a family from a well-known Torah town that the son was molested by the teacher and the family is threatened to shut up because the teacher's father-in-law is one of the heads of the yeshiva and all oh, this crazy stuff. And they asked me what to do. I said, what to do? Either throw the guy in jail or break both his arms and his legs so he never touches another child again. And... and 
This Bravo is great. for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I don't hide about this. I'm not politically correct. I'm Good politically for correct. you. You are out of the box. I think that exactly. the only way to fix problems yes. is to address them and, and not be politically correct, especially, and that's the only way that we can fix it. That you exactly. see change. Say, what it's the do? only way to see change. What to do? Turn the guy into the cops. Oh, but then I'm going to be running out of the community. You don't want to live in a community like that. Go live in, I don't know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Go live in a Fula. Go live somewhere else. Go live in a, on, a, on a farm in North Dakota, but not to live in a place where there's children. Such low life behavior in the name of Torah. It's a Chilun Hashem. Yeah. My favorite thing in the world is Kiddush Hashem. The thing I hate most in the world is Chilun Hashem. This child molestation within our community, this is the biggest chilashem that it can be. Or touching, chas v'sholem, touching, you know, another man, touch, touching another woman outside of the context of halacha, of chupan, kiddushim, in a million years, never, never. And you hear these nasty stories about all these type of things that the, that guy runs off with somebody else and a woman runs off within the community. It's right. Hashem. And I say it like it is. So I'm not popular. I'm not running for office. I'm not running for it to be the head of, uh, of a Gouda or Shas. And I'm not trying to run through Knesset. Okay. So if we see something like the referee on the football game in Mundial, it says offside, offside. That's offside. It can't be. And uh, I, I think it's the problem of a it's the problem, the challenge, the duty of a so spiritual leader to to say what's right and what's wrong. Right. I want to ask you, it, it brings me to my question, to another question. And that's exactly what we are talking. There is so many people that are struggling with underlying issues and demons. Like on one hand, they have a Muna, you see them wearing a yarmulke, going to temple. And on the other hand, you see them doing terrible, terrible things. They don't, and excuse one, me. Excuse me, Mrs. Mizrahi, they don't have a Mona. Right, have... that's what I was going to ask you. At what point should people take responsibility for their own action? Do you believe that they, those, they do those things because they don't have a Mona? Or do they have underlining issue, they have a Mona, but they have other issues that cause them to do it? Or do you think anybody who does those things does not have a Mona? No, they don't have a Mona. Or, they, no, they don't have a munah, and they cooperate with their Yetzirah. They're prisoners of war that the, 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 the go, to, go back and, and, and drop a bomb on your friends. They, they, they go, these are, they don't have a munah. Because if I have a munah, okay, I have a, let's suppose I have a Yetzirah. But there right. should be, but there has to be consequences for your Yetzirah, like in this case. Like, you, you can't no, just say, yeah, it's a Yetzirah. Okay, let, let me explain. Let me explain, Mrs. Cohen. If, if a guy goes into Walmart and he starts stealing, right, and he gets caught by the company detectives and take him to the police, and the police take him to the court, and he says, I'm not responsible. I have a kleptomaniac. He a, he's got a certified kleptomaniac. It did not me. Oh, yeah, he's got a kippah, and he believes in the sham, but he's sick. Okay, so the judge says, okay, sir, either you're going to go to jail if you're not a kleptomaniac, and if you are a kleptomaniac, I'm going to take you off the street and you're going to go to an insane asylum and take a treated enough to say that psychiatry says you're, you're cured. Mm -hmm. People have to take responsibility. Good. And why we all stumble along, we read Pilkei Avot. Ayin the Ozen Shomad. And all is is a I to see to to do something so terrible. Okay, let's say a person loves cheeseburgers, and he takes off his kippah and he takes off his tzitzit, and he wants to go to the other side of town to McDonald's to get a cheeseburger. Excuse me, is your yeshalhala so strong that you see Hashem doesn't doesn't see? That's what now, I was just thinking. It doesn't matter who you're hiding. Hashem sees you wherever right. you are. Okay, now here's what a person with emunah does. Suppose a person has an urge to do something wrong. The person, he can't guard his eyes. 
The, the Torah says lo tatu. Okay, and if you want to have shalom bite, you have to look at your wife. You can't look around other women and compare it. It's, it, it doesn't. If you don't look at other women, you don't come to touch other women. <laughs> you don't come to touch other women. <laughs> you don't come to bless other women. It all starts with lo tatu. We say the shema. So why do people do this stuff? Okay, so you got a yetzahal. What do you do with emunah? A guy said to me, Rabbi, I've got this terrible yetzahal and I want emunah. Okay, that's fine. I said, now you're going to close your sidor. You're going to go outside and go to the park and cry to Hashem. Hashem is boach. I love you. I believe in you. You said in your Torah, lo tatu. My yetzahal is Hashem, help me. Give me the strength to love you more than I love my ta'avot, more than I love my lust. And this would ask Hashem to help. Everybody has Yetzirah. Everybody has it. But what do we do with it? We go to Hashem. We go to Hashem. All these people that, like, they throw down their weapons. They throw down their weapons. They, they surrender to the Yetzirah. You surrender to the Yetzirah. But with Adam Lechavero, okay, it's bad enough if he surrenders to the Yetzirah and he takes off his seat and he goes to McDonald's and he buys a, a cheeseburger. He doesn't do it. It does only does damage to his neshama, but he doesn't do damage to another person. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easy to do tshuva for Adam Limakum. Mm -hmm. Hashem, oh, yeah, yeah, and says, a person has a, a, a lust on, on Yom Kippur to eat. And, and, and what he does, if this lust is going to kill him, then he should maybe smell the food, and then tell them to taste the food. Well, you know, understands a person has lust and maybe sometimes can't overcome it. But lust between Adam and Chaviro, this affects another human being. And it's not enough that to ask forgiveness for Hashem, you have to forgive this another human being. Now back to the case of child molesting, destroy a child. I, I think it's more humane to take a gun and put a bullet in the kid's head. Right. Because you just murder it one time, say two, that's it, finished. But this way, a child has to live with a murdered neshama all his life. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, ther I'm a therapist, so I see this daily. I work with children. I rest my case. I, yeah. I rest my case. I'll, I'll tell you, we were asked to be a borer, you know, like mitigate between a couple about three weeks ago. And we're sitting with the husband and with the rabbinit, and the, the couple doesn't get along, and he's cheater. He's cheating on his wife. He's a religious man. So we had him in a room and he, he's like really crying. And he's talking to us and he's like, I love my wife. I love my wife. And at part one point, I shouldn't have laughed because I'm not a therapist. I'm not like Karen. <laughs> and Karen will, you know, like she sees, like she tries to, and I looked at him, and I, that's why I asked you this question. Mm -hmm. I said, no, you don't love your wife. Because you love your yetzer more than you love your wife. If you truly loved your wife, you would not do it as much as you want to do it, as much as you would want it. But you're killing your soul. You're killing your four kids. You're like, you actually, that is more important. You're putting priorities. Life is about priorities. And if you put the priority there, then your wife and your kids are not the priority, which means your Yatsarara is taking over. Well, and he well, goes, it's exactly, not that simple. I love the answer. It's, it's a perfect answer. It's a perfect answer. Because you take a, a, a soldier that he loves his country and believes in what he's doing, and he has a Yatsarara that he wants to live. <laughs> yeah, wants right. to live. Okay, but because if you love something, you're willing to dedicate, this gives you the power. And when we love Hashem, we have the, the power to overcome, who does that be so hard? Everybody, but, but stop and think, why? I'm gonna make Hashem so disappointed? I'm, I'm Hashem's son, he's my father, he's all our father. How can any, and love me, every heartbeat comes from Hashem, every breath comes from Hashem. And Hashem has been with me through thick and thin. How can I do this to Hashem? And a husband, stop and think, Mr. Husband, what your wife went through and giving you those four kids, and well, what she went through raising those four kids, and I, I, just this trip, they asked me to, to visit a woman. She said she's in a wheelchair. She said mm -hmm. she can't get up from the wheelchair. And just to see what, the, what she's going through, the pain and dedication, but she loves her husband, she loves her family. To bring another child into the world, come on. And your wife has done that. 
How can you do it? And right. you know, when you have girls at the house and you know, you happen to have girls and I go, you have girls, you're an example of the way they, they expect their husband to, as much as the wife didn't tell them anything, they hear the arguments, they, you're an example for your kids. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, Rabbi, I want to shift once again with a, a, a different question before Etty will ask you the last question. Um, in the past, you have been associated more closely with Breslev Hasidus, uh, specifically with Rabbi um, Arush and Chut Shel Chesed. Um, would you still consider yourself a Breslever? Uh, what people don't know, I was very associated with Breslev. I learned Rabbi Nachman, but uh, there's a lot of things being done in the world. And Rabbi, let me, let me explain. Let me explain something, uh, Mrs. Cohen. My Rebbe is the Melitzer Rebbe. He is son after son of Rebbe Chlazlachever and the Baal Shem Tov. He's not a Baal Shuvah. He's got a way of Torah. He's a tzaddik, and he's a brilliant Torah scholar and a posseg. And he won't do anything if he didn't hear it from his father and his grandfather all the way back. This is my connection. This is a Baal Shuvah. My connection all the way back to Moshe Albein. Uh, there are a lot of things done and please don't ask me to mention names and things. And I you know Rabbi Sholom, you should be healthy. Okay, first of all, I wanted to do my own thing, not just as a translator for him. I had very many things, but like in the last three and a half years, I've written five books, Bol Hashem. If you go on Amazon and Google- I went, I, I ordered them. <laughs> okay. two, of my, two of the five are books. We both did. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Two of the five books, Divine Direction and 13 Principles of Amuna, they're in the top 100 Orthodox books of Amazon. Okay. Yay! But yeah, Bo Hashem. And so I had to do this. And I had to have the freedom mm -hmm. to go where I want, do what I want. I help everybody. I don't have uh, institutions that I have to finance. And I believe that everybody should have the right to learn Amuna without a price tag and you know, people know what I do and, and they help me. And I don't understand that. I don't like to, to be an Emuna business like you're in construction business or in real estate business. And right. Emuna bring the Shemot. Okay. And as far as Breslev, I, I love Rabbi Nachman and I don't have any contact in the organizations that are called Breslev today. But I, you know, it's so funny because uh, one of the things I read about you is all your lectures, because we went on and a lot of stuff, you know, you need to pay for certain lectures. And it was kind of nice and refreshing to see to see a rabbi, who, because we know we have a podcast. It's very costly business. You have a producers, you have the editing. And for you to offer that to the public for free is uh, very impressive. Yeah. Karen and I do the same thing. So we know that it's not an easy task to sponsor everything yourself. And, but, it's very, but it's very fulfilling. In the whole, yeah. You feel really good. I'll give you an example. Mrs. Mizrahi, last night at my lecture in, in the Valley at Chazak last night, a woman comes up and I see this woman because she participates in my Wednesday night. It's Wednesday night in Israel. And here in California, it's, it's in the late morning. Wednesday Zoom class, open to anyone, and we have private invitation. We don't put invitation by way of Facebook because uh, we better get that invitation, Karen. <laughs> yeah, we need to be on your no. we need to be on your VIP list because we are super fans. <laughs> okay, go on laserbeams.com, go in the subscription, and I'll see Karen Cohen and I'll see Eti Mizrahi or Hashem. Put up for subscriptions, and then you'll get. The link to the Zoom meetings all the time, oh. and even we don't get the link to the Zoom meetings if you can't make it in California time at ten thirty in the morning when it's eight thirty p.m. in Eretz Yisrael, you'll get the link to the replay, and all you know all, all, all the news with greatest to be my honor with greatest with greatest pleasure. But this woman comes up, and then this woman she donates to my organization of Muna Beams. She donates twenty six dollars a month, and I told her. I said, look, Cindy, you see all these people here? I said, you're my partner. This is, this is you. This is you. This is people like you that enable me to do this. I don't have to ask anyone for money. There's a big difference. When I teach Emunah, 
and then when I'm expecting a speaker's fee, okay? I could get, people would give me a speaker's fee if I want, but that is we're selling a shem. But Hashem, Hashem gives that, ask Hashem, Hashem, everyone should have you. Everyone should have you. I have people on my podcast, 35 to 40% aren't Jewish from Norway, from South Africa, from wow. Singapore. Amazing. And they're, they're playing off. They've taken the crosses and thrown it out of their house. And they've accepted the seven mitzvot b'nei noach, seven ohai mitzvahs. This is tikkun olam. It's tikkun olam. Wow. wow. And want this want is- to ask this is, you before we wrap up, can you tell us a little bit of the concept of mind and body and how is it related uh, to amuna and bitachon? Certainly, with pleasure, with pleasure. First of all, I want to say uh, a lot of the rabbani that they have, Big bellies. I said, <laughs> did, did you learn the Rambam? Oh, yes, we learned the Rambam. I said, you learned the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter? Uh, 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 then he starts stuttering. I said, the Rambam's laws of nutrition, you learn? The Rambam's laws of exercise, you learn? I don't think so. I don't think so. My whole philosophy of mind and body, and I have to pray for this, Hashem, enable my body to be strong so I can do my shlichut in the world. To, I can do this and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, when you see Mrs. Mizrahi, Mrs. Cohen, the two uh, attractive Jewish mothers and, and, and they're, they're smiling, they're in good health. This is Kiddush Hashem. It's Kiddush Hashem. It's Kiddush Hashem that for, like I said, when, when, I, when I help my wife and diet and workout and, and instruct her, you know, it's Kiddush Hashem. For, for a Jewish woman to be beautiful. This is the Gemara, this Rabbi Yishmuel. Okay, Kiddush Hashem, because when somebody looks and they see a nice looking Jewish woman, that, that, oh, they say, hey, she, she, what's, why is she so good looking? And this one looks in the mirror and she's full of wrinkles and full of this, and because you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're out on the beach and you're, you're, burning your, you're burning your skin and, and all kinds of things. Well, she's happy and they want to be like you. Just by being who you are is Kiddush Hashem. So I say the body is a vehicle to serve Hashem. The body is just like a pair of tefillin or like a tzitzit to serve Hashem. So especially at my age, and I have to go around the world and say, Hashem, I'm not doing my exercises to be fast, to win records, to build muscles. I need to be in good shape. I need to be have good stamina. Hashem, let me do it this way. So it means that I eat not what I like. I eat what's good for the body. Okay. I eat the, for, it's, and that's what King Solomon says. Uh, King Solomon says that a person should eat for the satiation of the soul, not for the body. You really eat for the body, good for the soul. So, which means that, okay, you can have a, a piece of cake on Shabbat, on a Shabbat. Shabbat is a cheat day, even in a, in a diet, if somebody has a stern diet, you have to have one cheat day a day. And one cheat day for us, it's Shabbat, okay? One day you can have a richer food that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have in the middle of the week or- We don't gain weight on Shabbat. No, we don't gain weight. <laughs> That's our philosophy, that's our philosophy. <laughs> okay, and, and then, then Sunday, Sunday, you take it off. Okay, Sunday, take it off. But the, the body should be subservient to the soul and not the soul be subservient to the body, shalom. And most of the population, the soul is a slave to the body. And as soon as the soul is a slave to a body, then the emotional problems difficult. You can train it all like that. That's why, and it was about, I got my first certification in 2014. It was, I think it was about 2011. And I was always an athlete, but I had some questions about a person's difficulties, and I was lacking knowledge in physical side. I knew that to, to answer the question properly, I had to have the physical and the spiritual. So that's when I studied, uh, started studying to, to be a, a fitness trainer. And my university background helped me a lot of the science stuff. So anatomy and physiology and fitness science. And uh, eventually, I got certification as a holistic nutritionist because nutrition is very important. With everything I learned was to get this treatment, I'd come back, come back to the Rambam because they're diets that make you crazy. One diet tells you eat nothing but meat and fat. Eat all the eggs you want. 
Another diet tells you eat nothing but carbs. This diet says no carbs. This diet says full carbs. What, what, what do you think about intermittent fasting, which is such a trend these days? What do you think about that? Intermittent fasting, it depends when it's, it, it's healthy. It's healthy to keep a big window, but it depends on your lifestyle. There's one thing. Uh, the reason a person needs an individual coach, I believe in what's called biochemical individuality. Just as you have your own thumbprint, you have your own DNA, and one diet be good for you, one diet, one, no. Now, if the intermittent fasting, sometimes people get so starved that when they come back after a 12-hour fast and they binge, they'd be better off. For some people, it's better to eat smaller meals, more frequent. And for some people, it's good. It depends right. on the person. And I don't, I don't hold by anything that's for everybody. The only thing that's for everybody is Tayyab Mitzvot. 613 minutes old. This is for everybody. Amen. It's so funny. My daughter, my oldest daughter, is a surgeon. And she, you know, she likes to study also. She grew up Orthodox. And she goes, Ima, now that she's a surgeon, she goes, I always knew the Rambam is smart. But now when you're a doctor and you read the same material, you realize how smart, what a genius he was on all elements of life. And she goes, he was really a genius um, because she said from what she studied in terms of biology, chemistry, everything, she goes, as a doctor, as physician, now I read what he wrote. And she goes, you realize how true every word that he wrote, you know? He's 100% of... right. She's 100% right. Oh. That's it. from all your children. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Brody, thank you so much, Rabbi, for joining us today. We are so honored to have you here and learn more about you personally and the true meaning of Amuna and Bittachon. Your dedication to our community and our people is to be admired. Both Eti and I have been following your lectures and podcasts and our souls feel uplifted after each episode. With all the horrible things in the world, especially in the past two to three years, we feel this world will be a better place if people have more Amuna. We know your trip to Los Angeles is very short, but next time you're in Los Angeles, we would love for our husbands and I to take you out to dinner. So that would be our honor to do that. And um, also we would like to take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Sarah Peretz for helping us to facilitate this interview on such short notice. She's such a remarkable woman. We would like to also thank all of our followers for listening to this episode. Please remember, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and TikTok at Yentas in the City. Um, you could also write to us at dearyentas at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and answer your letters on our weekly advice column. Thank you again, Rabbi. It's truly an honor. And we would like to thank our sponsors, Soft Smart Systems International and Conquest Realty Investments. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. We have a lot more coming. This is Karen Cohen and Etty Elkis, and we are Yentas in the city. Thank you so much. Be Thanks. safe and remember to be the Ruth in the room. I want to mention that I've come in contact with a lot of interviewers and uh, Rabbanit Etty and Rabbanit Karen, you are phenomenal interviewers and Neshot Chayel, and you bring honor to the Jewish people. And I'm going to tell you, it's a delight being with you. And your podcast, Bo Hashem, it should influence many people and excite many yeah. people. And you should have tremendous success. Thank, Thank you, you so Amen. much. With a mentor Thank like you, you yes. we can only succeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.